John Siegenthaler, David Halberstam, and others have observed that the story of the relationship between constitutional law, politics, and the direct action campaign for civil rights is a story of one of the most important periods in the evolution of newspapers, radio, and television. Most civil rights movement historians and lawyers would agree that the media's coverage of the movement played a significant role in educating Americans about the realities of racial segregation in the South, enforced by both custom and state law. The role of the media was unquestionably vital to the success of the movement's efforts following the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education. But there is a story within the story. As Mr. Siegenthaler discusses with us in our earlier interview with him, certain newspapers and magazines courageously educated America about the struggle for racial equality in written accounts and photographs. And an emerging television industry revealed in newsreel footage the events that defined the movement, including the violence of Southern resistance to school desegregation, voter registration, and access to public accommodations without regard to race. But at the same time, certain newspapers, radio, and television stations in the Southern states promoted Southern resistance to the Supreme Court's holding in Brown and openly opposed federal enforcement of its mandate. In our interview with John Siegenthaler, we explored his own experience as a journalist who covered the movement and later his role in the Kennedy Justice Department. In this interview with Martin Firestone, we see another facet of the legal history of the media and the civil rights struggle, one which reveals the challenge to early established television stations that promoted white supremacy in Southern communities that were as much the home of black citizens as white citizens. The focus of our discussion with Mr. Firestone is his involvement in Office of Communication of United Church of Christ versus the Federal Communications Commission, a case that is the subject of Kay Mill's book, Changing Channels, The Civil Rights Case That Transformed Television. Martin Firestone's legal career included service as a member of the FCC's legal staff, and that experience gave him a unique perspective as he later assumed the legal representation of Civic Communications Corporation, a group which not only opposed the renewal of the FCC license held by WLBT Television in Jackson, Mississippi, but challenged WLBT for the license. The case would become the most important test of the Fairness Doctrine and the right of citizens to participate in the process that required television stations licensed by the FCC to honestly represent the public interest. Mr. Firestone, we thank you for being with us today on the campus of the Stetson University College of Law to discuss with us your personal perspective of the landmark case of Office of Communication, United Church of Christ versus the Federal Communications Commission. Could you briefly describe the situation that WLBT television was in when the United States Supreme Court announced its ruling in Brown versus Board of Education. In Mississippi, the reverberations were tremendous. Uh, there was a perceived threat to a socioeconomic structure that had been in place since hundreds of years. And the reaction was one first of extreme violence particularly starting in about 1961 when the Freedom Riders came down from up north, the Freedom Rights Summer. Uh, the murder rate was unbelievable. And in fact, it has always been my opinion that of the Deep South segregationist states, Mississippi was the most violent from the standpoint of homicide. Murder in Mississippi was a form of intimidation of civil rights activists. The other aspect of it was, which involved WLBT-TV, was a conscious effort to isolate the civil rights community in Mississippi from what was going on in the movement outside of Mississippi. So the result was very little, if any news, was coming in via WLBT-TV. 
Now, there was another TV station in Jackson at the time. It was a combination of NBC, uh, ABC and CBS. But WLBT-TV, as the NBC affiliate, was the most powerful electronic voice in the state of Mississippi. And their failure to cover this effectively cut off Mississippi civil rights activists from support, at least psychological, if not actual physical, from the movement outside the state. The Fairness Doctrine can be traced back in FCC history to 1949. Revisit for us the essential concept of the Fairness Doctrine and how the civil rights movement, and specifically complaints about station editorials at WRAL in Raleigh, North Carolina, and WLBT in Jackson, Mississippi, would bring the Fairness Doctrine to center stage in the legal history of civil rights. First, you guys thought with the premise that the airwaves were always considered and are considered under the law an asset, a resource of the public. The Fairness Doctrine looked at it and said that when that asset, a re public resource, was used by a broadcast facility, that the public that listened to that facility uh, was entitled to hear contrasting viewpoints on the issue that was being discussed. And the reason for that was that simply going back to 1947 and as late as 1960, there were not that no great a number of available electronic outlets in this country. FM radio was in its infancy and hardly used. UHF television was non-existent, and cable wasn't even cable. It was community antenna television, merely picking up and repeating signals. So therefore, there was a need to ensure that when a controversial issue of public importance was discussed in an editorial fashion on a broadcast facility, that facility had an obligation under the Fairness Doctrine to present a contrasting viewpoint. The challenge to the renewal of WLBT's FCC license also raised the issue of standing. That is, whether the public had a right to participate in the FCC process that determined the renewal of a television station's broadcast license. Could you share with us your perspective of the importance of this issue in the context of the civil rights movement in Mississippi and elsewhere at the time? Well, first of all, un under a prior case called the Sanders Brothers Radio case, the public didn't have a right to participate in that process. The public interest at that time was considered to be within, to, well, was considered to be the province of the FCC. That, as the government agency, was the protector of the public interest so that the public had really no standing. They could go and complain to the commission, but the determination of whether the complaint was justifiable as not being in the public interest was solely and exclusively that of the commission. And the only time that the public had standing as a party in interest to an FCC proceeding was if there was specific identifiable economic injury. The, the UCC, first, first case of the UCC series, changed that entirely and said, no, the public interest is also the concern of the public, and they have a right to participate in and be heard as a participant, not as not only the complainant, but a participant in the process of determining whether that station was acting in their interest. And we will walk through that aspect of the court's ruling in a moment. But first, I'd like you to mention the third piece in the conceptual framework of the case. The case also raised the issue of the denial of airtime. How would you describe the relationship between this specific issue and the principal question of the integrity of the Fairness Doctrine? It was, it was parallel with touchings at various points in the process. Because the Fairness Doctrine, again, went to the issue of editorializing, 
What LBT TV was doing was a conscious, deliberate effort to isolate the civil rights activists in Mississippi from what was going on around the rest of the country. Therefore, there were the instances of Thurgood Marshall appearing on NBC Today or Good Morning America. Network trouble. We can't show it. Come back later. Even though we are the NBC affiliate for this community. More telling, and this is somewhat anecdotal, there was a demonstration, a sit-in, by Tougaloo College students. Tougaloo College being an all-black college right outside of Jackson. Sit-in at the lunch counter at the downtown Woolworths in Jackson, which up to that time had been exclusively white. They sat there, they had mustard and ketchup poured on their heads. WLBT TV News, they were there, taking pictures, doing audio, etc. That clip showed on the NBC network, but not in Jackson. Here is an incident in their backyard, literally within walking distance of their studios, involving their local people, and never made it onto the earth onto the station. And that was pervasive. The other thing was to project the image and continue to protect the, project the image of a segregated society. And this goes, for example, to the Teenage Dance Party, which was a local te television program produced and directed by and conducted by WLBT-TV. When they came under the pressure from the FCC, uh, and this program was raised as one of the issues, they said, well, you know, you've got 49% of your, your, your viewing audience, your potential viewing audience are, are black, no, t no t black teenagers on your dance party. Their response was, yes, we'll put one on, and they did. One all white, one all black. So it was what, much more than just a denial of time, it was the, the isolation and the, the continued projection of a socioeconomic culture in which WLBT, as part of that, continued project on, their, on the facilities. How did the FCC view the license renewal process at the time? The Office of Communication of the United Church of Christ did not want the station. What was its concern, and how did its position create the occasion for questioning the Commission's own view of the license renewal process? We've got to go back again to what a relatively a relative stone age of the broadcasting industry. And with limited facilities, as I said, you know, limited number of stations, uh, limited in large measure by technical reasons, not by uh, choice. And there were only so many TV stations you could put into any given geographic area. So that the requirements for obtaining a license and the requirements for renewing a license got very much into program content to the extent that stations, when filing an application, had to say, this is what we propose to broadcast in the way of educational programming, religious programming, agricultural programming, and that would be then, as, and this is how these programs will serve our community. I don't know whether that would pass a First Amendment test today, but then because of the scarcity, that same scarcity that justified the Fairness Doctrine, justified the, the government asking these stations to provide that. Now, the UCC, their interest was that Yes, these proposals are made, but are they being uh, are they being performed? Are they, these representations being carried out, and are they being carried out in a way that might be discriminatory? Now, their first complaint against WLBT TV went back to 1957, and in part that was that that was precipitated, that compl complaint was precipitated because of the uh, run for uh, the House of Representatives by Reverend R.L.T. Smith. 
and Reverend Smith was going to run for Congress, and they weren't going to put him on the TV station. And the UCC became involved. And they were, the UCC was also very much familiar with what was going on in Jackson because of the United Church of Christ's relationship with Tougaloo College. And that, that is what brought them in. They were not interested in any monetary reward. They were not interested in obtaining the license. They were trying to get a licensee to comply with their obligations and representations to the commission. A significant aspect of Southern legal strategy in civil rights cases was to attempt to frame the fundamental issue as a question of states' rights. Could you share your thoughts on WLBT's argument that the issue at stake was states' rights or state sovereignty? Uh, the issue was segregation. They, uh, those, and there were two forms of, 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 segre of segregationists in the state. You gotta understand that. There was the Klan, and the Klan was ready to burn, murder, and do other acts of violence to perpetuate segregation. And then you had what I call the country club segs. They were looking at it strictly from their socioeconomic position in the community and wanted to maintain it. So rather than talk about segregation, what they characterize it as the protection of, quote, Mississippi values, unquote and that related to the state being able to establish its own social and moral codes. Writing for the Federal Circuit Court for the District of Columbia Circuit, Judge Warren Berger observed that the FCC's denial of standing to the parties challenging the renewal of WLBT's license revealed that both the commission and the broadcast industry, and I'm going to quote Judge Berger, failed to grasp the fact that a broadcast license is a public trust subject to termination for breach of duty, and that this compelled public participation in the license renewal process when serious public interests were at stake, and where there was credible evidence of lack of fairness in the coverage of issues related to those interests. How important were his observations in that first decision? They were not only important, they were right on. And it goes back to what I said previously. The commission looked with, as the judge said, hostility, because the commission perceives itself as the protector of the public interest. And therefore, anyone other than themselves getting involved in a public interest issue involving broadcasting was considered an interloper, even though it was the public which presumably the station was acting as the custodian of those frequencies for them. So he was right on there. The, uh, and the, that mentality was also obvious and evident in the conduct of the, they called them hearing examiners then, now they called administrative law judges, in the way he handled the, the evidentiary showing of the United Church of Christ because the commission was somewhat put out, but it was unavoidable, because the type of evidence that the UCC produced in filing their complaint with the FCC had never been done before. They had monitored that station on virtually a daily, hourly basis. They had hard evidence, substantive evidence, not, not anecdotal, not conjectural, but hard evidence of this is what happened. Thurgood Marshall was on, they had network trouble. Reverend King was on, gone. They had network trouble again. So there was a, a con, what we call an issue of fact was presented. And the commission found it unavoidable and so had to set it for hearing. But once at hearing, the judge could say, the administrative law judge said, well, I'm not so sure about this level of evidence and this and that. Uh, question the methodology of it, question the, the credibility of the witnesses. And the broadcast industry was delighted because they would much rather deal with a friendly commission than a hostile public.
And this becomes a central issue in the second case. On remand from the circuit court, the FCC granted WLBT a three-year license on the basis of WLBT's assurances concerning its future conduct. On appeal for the second time, Judge Berger described the hearing examiner's perspective as a, quote, curious neutrality in favor of the licensee. He then wrote that the fairness doctrine plays a very large role in assuring that the public resource granted to licensees at no cost will be used in the public interest and that the challenging party's evidence of bias on the issue of racial discrimination should have been considered. Describe the significance of his conclusion that further consideration by the FCC would serve no useful purpose and your perspective of his order that the commission take applications. I mean, how can you justify a record first that warranted only a one-year renewal of the license and that upon remand at the direction of the court, you look at the same evidence and say, well, we believe them now, we didn't believe them then, so we're going to give them a full three-year license in order to show us how well they're going to do. As part of that, you see, was that WLBT was, began to get the message that they were in trouble uh, and that they were trying to avoid it mightily. They re had changed counsel at one point uh, to ha retain the law firm of Arnold Fortas and Porter, well-known Democrat firm, uh, very liberal firm, and under pressure from that law firm, they started to moderate some of their conduct. And they were hoping that between that and the representation of a uh, firm with the proper credentials, the commission would be persuaded, as it was, to give them a full-term renewal. The court was not going to buy it. I think it is not going too far to say they had no trust, no faith in the credibility of the commission. The court vacated the FCC's grant of the license to WLBT and directed the FCC to invite applications for the license. You had filed the application on behalf of your client, Civic Communications Corporation, before the court's second opinion was announced, and the FCC had refused to accept that application. How did you now proceed in light of the court's second opinion ordering the commission to consider applications. We immediately geared up and started preparing for a comparative hearing because we knew other applications were coming in, and they did very rapidly. Your argument emphasized that your client offered distinct opportunities for the commission and the future of this television station. My client was a unique coming together of elements in Mississippi that uh, had never had an opportunity to present their views in the media, controlled by them. It was the first application ever in which voting control of the corporation would be in the hands of local black Americans. And it was, would be the first, if we were granted, the first television, well, first major market, VHF, television station, network affiliated, to be owned and controlled by black Americans. And we thought we had the expertise, and certainly the period people we had, uh, knew their community, worked in the community, suffered in the community, and we gave the commission the opportunity finally to do the right thing. And you had the essential rationale of the court's decisions to support your position that change was necessary and that new ownership was necessary to affect that change. And dramatically different new ownership. When you look at the, the applications that were filed, it spanned the spectrum of Mississippi socio economic culture. We were, my client was, the epitome of the, you want to call it, the liberal, Democrat, 
civil rights activist group, all native Mississippians with the two exceptions, all active in the civil rights movement. I looked at it from the standpoint of as they, they developed their proposals, that we, we provided the commission as the only applicant that could without doubt provide the service that had never been provided in Mississippi. Could you give us a sense of the legacy of this case, considering the deregulation of the industry which would later occur, and your perspective of the legacy of the Fairness Doctrine itself? I think the legacy of the case is that following the, the standing decision in the UCC first, first case, that the public has the right to get in and express its views within the governmental regulatory context on any communications matter where there's a legitimate cause for concern. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's radio, television, and now extending into the new technology. So that, I think, is, is where that, that goes. As far as the new technology, the complexity of those issues is, is enormous. But it's going to take a new generation of young people who have, I'm a Luddite. Uh, when I started, went on the internet to, uh, to send emails to my grandsons, one of them sent me a return email and said, gee, Grandpa, if you live long enough, you'll make it into the 20th century. This was in the 21st century, by the way. So it's the young people who are dealing with this technology as a matter of course, who are going to have to decide how do you deal and how do you, you bring together the concept of public participation and the ability for the public to express its views as to content. But on the other hand, how do you do that without infringing First Amendment rights? Because you've got to understand, we no longer have the issue of scarcity. In fact, God knows there's too many outlets. That's the one factor. The second is, as a matter of pure law, the FCC and the government has no statutory authority to regulate cable television or the internet. So you have an immediate battle over whether legislation is appropriate. And can you develop any legislation going to internet content or cable content that does not violate the First Amendment? As a former FCC lawyer, a civil rights advocate, and a student of the broadcast industry's role as gatekeeper of the public interest, what is your vision of the role of the broadcast industry today? And what are your concerns as you look ahead? The difficulties are enormous. They are enormous. Uh, life was easier when I went to the FCC. We weren't dealing with thousands and thousands of, of ways of communicating with the public. How that can be regulated, if you want to use it in the broadest sense of the word, that's going to come from the young people who know how to work with that technology. It's not going to come from old dinosaurs like me. It has to be done within the framework of some community civility so that there is, there is discussion. There cannot be the, the, the acrimony that I see now, the, 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 the horrendous partisanship, the, 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 personal, the personalizing of, of, of of attacks on, on, on public figures. And I'm talking about both sides. I, I, I am a, a bipartisan skeptic of both parties. But I, I would tell you, I think that the young people now, leaving aside a lot of you know, bad publicity that some of them get, are solid young people. I think that those they, they know what they're dealing with in technology, and I would hope that when they, they look at the law, and that's what you're doing, 
a law is not just rules, regulations, and statutes. It is, and it's always been my philosophy, you want to change the system, you use the system to change the system. Use the system. We have a unique form of government. And public participation is the way to change the system. I'm not talking about protests. Reverend King's protests were peaceful. They brought the issue to the fore. But the fact of the matter is, when it got down to it, it was changing the law that changed the society. And that's where I see and hope that the new coming generation of lawyers who, by being lawyers, are, should be leaders, will see you use the system to change the system.